Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Jonathan Bennett joins me again, and we're going to be talking about new ways to use blockchains for really, really powerful stuff. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E. FLY dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Jonathan Bennett. Episode 394, recorded June 28th, 2016. Lisk. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week. The movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be doing every, using every day and not aware of it, projects you may want to download right after the show and start playing with it, or maybe projects you want to even get involved with as part of the community efforts. I'm Randall Schwartz. I said that already, but I could say it again because they let anybody do this show. Okay, I'm currently in uh, – oh, before I do that, let's go ahead and bring on our co-host, fresh back from last week, having been approved as one of the rotating panel co-hosts, Jonathan Bennett. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Randall. It's good to be back. Didn't expect to be here again so soon, but uh, looking forward to it. Yes, yes. Well, it's awesome. And you did a great job of uh, so, so good last week that I said, yeah, if he wants to do it again, let's have him do it again. Uh, I'm currently speaking to you from the 15th floor of a hotel uh, that's nearby the Moscone Center in uh, downtown San Francisco. I'm attending the Red Hat Summit. Uh, this is a, you know, three or four hundred speakers at this show. So uh, a bunch of exhibitors, all sorts of great things. And I hope to do like I did with OSCON, which is collect up a bunch of uh, uh, future guests. Like we had a lot of guests coming out of OSCON. In fact, I think today's guest came out of OSCON. Um, so uh, that's really great. And where are you speaking to us from? I'm here at corporate headquarters in uh, Lawton, Oklahoma, which also doubles as my home office. Okay, cool, cool. And uh, we have an interesting project today, probably a fairly technical project um, from the sense of, uh, you know, being all about cryptocurrency and things like that. Uh, it's called LISC. And apparently they're sort of in their early rollout phases. Uh, I think maybe already reached uh, the point of mainstream where you can actually use it uh, for your activities. Um, and we're going to bring on Max Kordek, who is the, uh, I believe he's the CEO of the company. Uh, and, uh, but it's still confusing to me. I know a little bit about cryptocurrency. Uh, unfortunately, Aaron, who usually handles our cryptocurrency shows, uh, was not available today. So, um, uh, but, so, but uh, Jonathan, I understand you've done some research on this. I've looked into it a little about, bit. What, yeah, you can tell us uh, what, uh, what, what LISC is. Com is, it, is it just another cryptocurrency or is it some other thing? I keep seeing the word JavaScript all through the, the online documentation, but I don't understand how that plays together. Um, so I bet we're going to have a lot of questions for our guests because it sounds like neither of us really got much from the elevator pitch. Would you agree? Uh, there, there were a few things that stuck out as interesting from the elevator pitch. Um, one of the things okay. that they mentioned several times is side chains, and that's something I want to learn more about. Um, but I think it is. It's another cryptocurrency that they, they've tried to do some things differently, and, and I'm looking forward to learning about it. Very cool, very cool. Without us, uh, you know, without us... Continuing to guess when we actually have the expert on the line, let's go ahead and bring on Max Kordek. Max, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Great. And where are you speaking to us from? I'm currently here in Aachen in my office, but, um, yeah, this won't be forever. Soon we'll move to Berlin. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, can you give us the 30,000-foot view about LISC? What? What problem is it solving? That's usually the best way to talk about this. Um, okay, so LISC allows the deployment of blockchains, which we um, just heard about as mentioned as sidechains. And then a developer can build a blockchain application or service on top of it. So if you're asking me what problem it tries to solve, it makes the world of applications more decentralized and more connected throughout the world. Well, that's pretty fascinating. So you, it, you're actually able to put code into some request and then have other people run it? Okay, so um, first of all, the blockchain for blockchain applications at LISC is like a database on which you are saving all the data, which is being accumulated by your app. And um, because 
your blockchain app can be secured by a multitude of nodes. This means it's decentralized. And um, this allows a lot of different types of applications. You can have financial applications, you can have social applications, you can have sharing economies, games, and so on. And because a lot of people are running those applications in a decentralized manner, it means that it can't be shut down by a government or by a company which might not want to see it. Okay, but I'm still sort of wondering then, you're, you're actually putting code into the blockchains? Um, you, you don't put the code into the blockchain. The blockchain is, as I mentioned, just a decentralized database. The code okay. is running is in any other normal application in the back end, and you have your front end, which allows you to access the functionalities of your app. And yeah, well, this app is then like being installed on a multitude of nodes, and it's just running them there. Okay. I'm I'm still a little fuzzy. <laughs> I, is this, is this, is, this is an innovative concept. Then is this? Are you guys the first to kind of attack attack this uh, area of interest? Um, if you're a developer nowadays and you want to build some decentralized technologies, you don't really have a framework available which makes it more easy for you. And Lisk is one of the first ones, or maybe even the first ones. Uh, which allows you to do that. Um, otherwise, you would have to take care of so many different stuff, which is really on a rocket science level. Like you would have to take care of the peer-to-peer -peer networking of the consensus and so on. And this is already taken care of by Lisk. And you can really concentrate on your app itself, on the back end, on the front end, on the user experience and so on. Okay, so... Um yeah, I'm still trying to still trying to sort this out. I there's a lot of big. Work. I think probably the problem is you know I, I sort of understand the basics of how Bitcoin works. So how is this? How is what's happening beyond like what Bitcoin is doing? I think because a lot of our audience knows what Bitcoin is. So how is this? Is this something bolted onto Bitcoin? Is this something that acts like a brand new set of blockchains, but not related to Bitcoin? How, how does that work? Um, okay, so we have a complete new blockchain which acts like a hub for all these sidechains, okay? So you have like one big blockchain and all these sidechains running um, yeah, on top of it or next to it. And um, with it, we also have our own cryptocurrency called LSK or simply LISK. Um, and our code is entirely new. So we are not a fork of Bitcoin or other platforms, which often happens in this ecosystem. But um, we are really something new, which wants to disrupt the market of applications. Uh, I can explain it a little bit more in detail. So Bitcoin itself is also just a decentralized application, okay? It has a blockchain as a database which saves all transactions occurring on the network. And then the code itself is embedded into the application itself, which simply connects to the blockchain. Um, it has its own consensus rules and so on. Um, and if I now make a, an extremely simple example, you have at Bitcoin only transactions which allows you to send money around. At LISC, you, know, you can now make in your, inside your sidechain a new transaction type, which allows you to embed it text, okay? And now you can program a messaging service with LISC, which sends transactions around on the sidechain, but which all um, includes small or bigger parts of text, um, which can be used for yeah, the just mentioned messaging service. So is, is LISC primarily the Bitcoin or is it primarily the extra services that go along with it? Which, which is kind of the, um, the top dog, as it were, on that? Um, okay, so LISC is more like the hub or the main blockchain or, or like a cluster which just connects the different sidechains to a main chain on which we have our own token. So you can also use these tokens on all these sidechains for your services. If you have a game, you can, already, you can simply use the LISC token to accept um, within your game. So you don't have to take care of all these exchanges stuff because people can plug in 
right into the existing Lisk ecosystem to acquire yeah, game tokens for your game. Um, and what we offer to the normal user is for once a client in which you have a decentralized or blockchain application directory. So you have an overview of all apps currently running on the network. And we also have like, um, or well, we will have a very simple gateway into this ecosystem, okay? So we will have mobile clients where you simply can search through the app store or the app directory and select your app you just want to run or try out with a simple click and then it starts up immediately. So we are trying to combine like the worlds of Bitcoin with the world of maybe Apple's App Store. Okay, we have some sort of an App Store and we have the cryptocurrency ecosystem running in the background. And by combining both, we um, yeah, are making the world or we are trying to make the world more decentralized. Okay, very interesting. We have a, a question from the chat room, uh, WI guy or Y guy. Uh, he wants to know about mining. How is this, um, how is this comparable to Bitcoin's mining? Is it a totally separate... Uh, uh, totally separate process. Yes, it's an entirely different process. Um, at Bitcoin, the mining part is um, or was being introduced in terms of consensus on the network to determine which guy on the network can generate the next block. Okay, um, and actually, when I got started or when I got introduced into the Bitcoin industry three years ago, I started mining as well in my small one-room student apartment. And it was loud, it was hot, and this just yeah made me into an anti fan of mine of mining. Okay, and um, in the recent months and years, other methods were being introduced, like proof of stake and delegated proof of stake. And Lisk is running on delegated proof of stake. That means you have one hundred and one delegates, which are securing the Lisk main blockchain. Um, in a federated way. So the whole network can can vote for these delegates. And then those 101 delegates with the most votes get into the top and actively generate new blocks for the main blockchain. And the same applies to all sidechains. Um, and now the question is, how can we um, make it easier for app developers to find delegates. Um, that's why in the future we want to introduce some kind of a delegate marketplace which, or on which users and app developers can search for delegates which offer specific or different kinds of services like, um, yeah, there will be an overview of the node, node specifications of the country in which the node is running in. And very important, um, which software is running in the background on the node. Because Lisk also wants to combine many different decentralized technologies. And a lot of people were asking us, why, why do you take delegated proof of stake? It's, not, it's maybe not the best or not the most decentralized solution on the market. So why did you take it? Um, and I always say them that delegate proof of stake is, first of all, extremely efficient and very fast. You have 10 second block times in comparison to Bitcoin's 10 minute block times. And additionally, you can now choose delegates for your sidechain, which runs very specific applications, other applications besides Lisk in the background. For example, if you need a decentralized storage layer for your blockchain application built on Lisk, then you might want to implement IPFS in the background um, of your app. Um, and now you have to select delegates on the network, which all have IPFS running locally, um, because your app might access the API of, of IPFS locally. Um, so that requires that some nodes which are securing your sidechain might have specific software running in the background as well. And this will also be addressed in this delegate marketplace. Okay. Um, so say I wanted to set this up on a server and become one of these nodes. What, what does that infrastructure look like? What's involved there? Um, if you want to set up your own nodes, you simply 
go to lisk.io, go to the documentation section, and then you have three options to install Lisk. You can install it with a simple installation script, so it's only one or two commands and Lisk is installed. Um, this is an option for all Unix-based systems, like Ubuntu or also Mac OS X. Um, and you also have the option to install Lisk from a Docker container. Um, this is available for Mac OS, Linux, and also Windows. Um, but if you want to, yeah, well, um, offer a real full node for the network itself, or if you want to secure like the main blockchain or sidechains, then we heavily um, recommend the Unix version, the normal one with the installation script. Um, and obviously, because we are huge fans of open source and Lisk is open source itself, you can also just install Lisk itself from the source code, which might be a little bit more complicated than the other options. Uh, what What is that source code licensed as? Is it GPL or Apache? or? It's the MIT license. Um, so how how does how does peer to peer work? I mean, how do you do NAT transversal and all of those ugly things? Um, okay, so first of all, I'm not the CTO of Lisk, so I'm not that <laughs> technical. Okay, um, if my following answer might not, um, yeah, well, be enough for some people, just go to our forum or chat and ask Oliver. Um, so how does peer to peer work at Lisk? Um, as I mentioned, um, there's always like a consensus model applied to blockchains, okay? And Lisk is using this delegated proof of stake consensus algorithm. That means um, I won't describe how the peer-to-peer -peer is being achieved on the on the low level, but in terms of the network itself, you have now 101 delegates um, with the mo most votes, and they are pinging to each others all the time and in a random fashion they are generating new blocks and because this is handled in such a federated way because the network always knows which delegates can secure or uh, can generate new blocks in this round it can be very fast it can be in 10 seconds to generate a new block um, in terms of bitcoin or nxt you always have like um like probability in the game, okay? And the network as a whole is always searching for the next node between all nodes who are actively securing the network. So, and this makes it a little bit more slower, but maybe more decentralized, but there's always a trade-off. Okay. Um, there is, there is some, it's, it's kind of apt, the timing on this interview, because there's something in the news about cryptocurrency recently that I noticed. Um, I'm not sure how many people followed the Brexit. So Great Britain voted to leave the EU and stock markets around the world just kind of crashed and fell apart. Um, two interesting things happened. First, gold went up in value, which was kind of expected. And Bitcoin went up in value as a result of this. So first off, did, did LSK see any bump as a result of Brexit? And then what do you think about this idea of a cryptocurrency as a safe harbor? Um, so, because of Lisk and because we had a crowdfunding, we have a lot of Bitcoin and I think Bitcoin actually went down. It was at 700 something and right now it's at 600 something. Um, but yeah, I see the notion behind the question. Um, first of all, I think that, yeah, due to the Brexit, there's a lot of uncertainty in the markets right now and cryptocurrencies definitely are an alternative, but I think they are still not here in the real world. Um, people associate software always with some kind of hacks or something like that. And even though Bitcoin is extremely secure, it's better tested for the past seven years or so, um, people or like the real rich people of the world still don't fully trust it. Some do, but the majority doesn't or don't. Um, and I think it needs a few more years to become like a safe haven uh, or like a digital gold. Um, but once we are at a stage where the majority of people and the majority of investors trust code rather than centralized institutions or governments, I think Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have a huge 
um, opportunity ahead to become like a safe haven for wealth. Um, in terms of the Brexit and Lisk, there was so in the crypto world, there's another player, another big player um, called Ethereum, and they had a few problems, um, not with their software directly, but with an app running on top of them. Um, I don't want to go too much into this detail, but this accident or this incident of which was a hacking accident and um, ended up of like being $50 million dollars being stolen in their cryptocurrency um, created a lot of uncertainties in the Bitcoin or altcoin markets as well. And Lisk also suffered a lot from that. Um, we were traded at, I don't know, $40 million at a, at a whole market cap before this in incident. But right now we are at $30 million. So it's, it's, it went down a lot, but I, I'm very optimistic that it will go up again in the future, but I don't want to make any projections or something like that. Um, but yeah, from the Brexit itself, Lisk didn't um, take any advantage or bonus. So the, the Ethereum hack was actually something I wanted to ask about as well. Um, first, does Lisk have something similar to the smart contracts idea that Ethereum uses? No. Um, so Lisk itself makes, or the developers who want to build blockchain applications um, are using our framework, which is like a template for a new sidechain and the backend and frontend code, um, which might be needed for that, uh, for an application. And now the developers comes and integrates new code inside the backend directly instead of like at Ethereum, just uploading a small script to the blockchain. So at least you're really developing a new application and you're not just uploading a script. Okay. Um, and yeah, so, so Lisk is quite different from Ethereum and we don't have smart contracts, but if a user wants to run smart contracts, he has two options. He can either integrate the Ethereum virtual machine directly inside or into a Lisk sidechain. This might be a little bit of work, but once someone did that, everyone who follows and wants to use it as well can simply integrate it. But the other option is, and I think it's at least for the beginning, the more easier option um, is to simply well, let the delegates run Ethereum in the background and then plug into the Ethereum network. So if you now want to generate a random number with a smart contract on Ethereum, for example, then you just, well, plug into the Ethereum blockchain, use this smart contract you, you uh, developed beforehand, give your request that you now want a random number and then, uh, well, get it into your Lisk blockchain app, okay? And I think um, this is quite powerful for Lisk blockchain applications because you can really include every type of app or every type of uh, technology or software inside your app, um, like Ethereum for smart contracts and trusted execution of code, um, IPFS for decentralized storage as well as storage or SIA. Um, and you can also use like um, more centralized services, which might be not fully decentralized, but they're extremely fast. And those can also be included into the Lisk blockchain app. So to finalize or to, to give a clear statement, no, we don't have smart contracts. We just, or the, de the developers are implementing new code directly inside the backend of their own smart, uh, of their own sidechain. So as a result of that, uh, Lisk is by design basically immune to the hacking that happened at the DAO with Ethereum. No, um, Lisk itself and all sidechains are still software and software is never immune to hacking <laughs> or to, to something similar. Um, by design, well, so I don't, I don't really want to give a statement about the DAO because, yeah, well, if, if a hacking happens at Google, Apple don't make a statement as well, right? But um, <laughs> in, in terms of, this, of the DAO, I mean, all would happen in a sidechain. And if there would 
be the need to introduce a hard fork. This would only be necessary to do on the sidechain and not on the main blockchain of Lisk. So that means the Lisk main blockchain stays secure from mistakes being done by third party developers. All right. So in this some is, ways you, yeah. uh, so in some ways you have, um, you have engineered around the problem. It's not totally gone, but it's almost like you have it separate away from the rest of the network so that when it blows up, it's not everything that blows up. It's just that particular app. Is that, is that kind of how it, how it works? Yes, exactly. Um, we imagine Lisk itself and the Lisk main blockchain simply, well, as like similar to an umbrella or like, like a harbor, as I already mentioned, um, so that everyone can really develop what he wants. Okay. He can change the sidechain format completely and it is still accepted by the Lisk because Lisk and the Lisk main blockchain only has a small link to the sidechain. Um, and this allows a lot of flexibility. Um, that means a sidechain developer can not only accept or not accept, but can not only support delegated proof of stake, he can also include proof of stake or proof of work even with a new co token, which is being mined only on the sidechain. So yeah, uh, list sidechains are like separated entities beside Lisk. Um, and they are like yeah encapsulated ecosystems but which can be connected with each other's truth apis now um i want to go back and actually touch some things that we haven't actually gotten to you but are fairly important where where is lisk in terms of deployment i understand there's something you said something about a crowds uh, funding uh what was that about and 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 what's happened so far yes yeah, so um Oliver and I had the idea about Lisk in the early 2016, so about five to six months ago. And only one month later, we decided to go public with the idea. And three weeks later after that, we already started the crowdfunding or the ICO, initial coin offering. And in that ICO, we offered our own Lisk token in exchange for Bitcoin. And in and we collected about 14,000 Bitcoin, which might be around $9 million today. And now like there are 4,000 people owning Lisk tokens and which are all striving to make them yeah, more valuable. Um, but the Lisk team itself doesn't really concentrate on the price. It concentrates only on the technology, okay? Um, and on promotion, marketing, and so on. Um, and in in terms of deployment, we are live since about one month um, and the platform itself is running in some kind of a beta stage and the app SDK to develop your own sidechain and app um, is currently in alpha state. We are currently heavily optimizing our backend and taking a lot of efforts in terms of security and stabilization. Um, because we think this is one of the most important parts of any service and any startup worldwide. Um, and we estimate that our platform becomes really usable for developers to build really great applications on top of in the next, I would say, four to six months. Um, once the app SDK goes out of the alpha state into the beta state. Um, and in the past weeks, we, it were like a hard, the, the past weeks were pretty hard for us because we are still a very small team. Okay. We are currently like six people trying to make Lisk better and we are slowly adding new employees, but this always takes time. Okay. And because we are just running for, for four weeks, um, we can't already have like a team of 15 developers. Um, but in literally two weeks, Oliver is moving to Berlin and I will follow in about four weeks and then we can really build up our team locally in Berlin. Uh, we plan to have a great, uh, and maybe, maybe five to 10 people. So a pretty small team, but a, a very great and talented team of developers working on core issues. 
Um, so yeah, we are pretty new. We are pretty, um, we, we are developing very fast, I would say, for what we have currently. And from here on, all development capacities only go up. We have a lot of money and we are going to spend it on development. So uh, is, is there a primary language being used by the back end and are there primary languages being targeted by the SDK? Um, the language is JavaScript. Um, on Lisk itself, we are using Node.js for the back end and we probably will port over the platform to TypeScript due to security reasons. But again, I'm not the CTO, so I don't have a lot of knowledge about that. Um, and the side chains will or are also coded in JavaScript. So um, we, we did that because we think it's a language known by a lot of developers and blockchain itself is already quite complicated. If I'm going to explain someone Lisk and blockchain and so on, it always takes like two hours. And we think that with JavaScript, we reduce this level to a minimum, at least in terms of the language we chose to, because it's just such an easy language and mostly everyone knows it was, uh, who's a developer. If I am running an app that wants to use uh, Lisk, uh, the project or the SDK or whatever, can it live entirely in the browser uh, uh, using something like maybe Angular and all that for the interaction? Or does it ha do I have to set up my own Node.js system and run some server-side code for my specific app? Yes, yeah, so... To secure the sidechain and to let new blocks being generated, um, someone has to execute your app on a server. Um, but it doesn't have to be you. Um, you can simply choose or search for other parties doing that for you. Um, and you mentioned Angular. Yeah, well, Angular is a front end framework and it's entirely possible to use it at Lisk. You can probably use every front end framework and maybe even a few um, others, uh, other development stuff I don't know so much about. Okay. So, and, and there's Lisk, the project, and Lisk, the company. Are they completely intertwined right now, or have you ha started to have outside contributors since your code is open source? Um, okay, so... At, at the moment, the Lisk company is still being created. Um, that's one part we are moving to Berlin as well. Um, it's, it's, it belongs to that. Um, but in terms of open source development, we, we already saw a lot of contributions by our community and by individuals who are providing fixes and new features to the back end code and front end code. Um, everything is being developed in public on GitHub and everyone can contribute. And we are seeing that a lot already and we love it. Um, I think this shows how powerful open source really is. Wow. Okay. Uh, but then comes the question, who controls the roadmap? Who controls the governance of the project? Yes, sure. Um, this is still in the hands of the Lisk team, or as you mentioned or said it, um, the Lisk company um, being, or cur currently that's part of what Oliver is doing at Lisk. He's observing every piece of code which might be introduced into the system um, and takes another look because security is one of the most important issues related to cryptocurrencies because real money is involved. So he is really taking um, yeah, like two looks on every new code which might be implemented into Lisk itself. So yeah, um, even though it, it's, it's open source and it's open source development, um, but I assume most of the code is still being contributed by our team and we still have control over all um, decision processes. I hope that we somehow can decentralize this in the future, but for the next three years or four years, I think this won't be possible. But yeah, maybe something or a similar structure like the DAO can be implemented right into the list, uh, which might control this. But yeah, again, this is many, many years um, in the future. 
And so do you have a do you have a game plan? Do you have a roadmap of where you want to keep taking this like the next three months, next six months, next year? Yes, definitely. Um, we have currently a roadmap internally because we are still like, we are not so sure in terms of team development. A lot is moving right now. We are, like I mentioned, moving to Berlin and I don't know exactly how fast we can move once we are there, when we get an office, how fast we can find new developers and so on. But we have one at this moment um, for probably the next two to three years. Um, and we want to make it public once we can be pretty certain when we get the chance to hire more developers and when we are more certain about the deadlines, um, we can say about the different, uh, like features we want to implement into LISC. Um, now are, are you, are you also a programmer or it sounds like you're more of a administrative right now? Um, I'm, I'm not really a programmer. I can do some simple stuff, but I'm like, uh, like some guy who can do everything a little bit. Um, I see my biggest strength in, um, knowing what the user wants and building a great product, making a great user experience and doing some marketing on the side. Um, that's why I'm the CEO. I'm like managing all this stuff while our genius developer, Oliver, is taking care of the code. And uh, I was just going to ask, uh, of the five or so people in the original core team, uh, what are some of their backgrounds? How, how did they come to you or how did you come to them and, and sort of have the same vision? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we have for once Joel. He is our community manager and he is with us um, for a long time, we know him like already for one year or one and a half year. And he's very, very good. He's like a real crypto enthusiast and he truly believes into the list vision. Um, and I'm really enjoying working with him. Um, he's a great guy. Um, besides that, in terms of developers, we have Ricardo. He is some kind of a tools developer taking care of tools development. We are currently developing a very simple Lisk client, which allows only um, to send money around, to send Lisk tokens around, but this with like 100% um, guaranteeness. Um, then mm. we have Isabella, uh, Francois, who are also, um, who have a very strong background, but I don't want to talk so much about other people's because I don't know what I can say and what I shouldn't, shouldn't say. <laughs> um, but... You, you can be certain that they're pretty strong and we are very lucky that we found them. Um, I think they're one of thousands. They're one out of thousands um, in terms of like skills and really they're, they're really top notch. And it's, it's more like luck that we got them into our team. Uh, and I'm very, very happy about that. All of us saw as well. And without them, we wouldn't be where we are here today. Uh, now, I've tried to use a, a few different JavaScript uh, editing environments, and uh, I'm sort of curious, do you have a kind of common one that your team uses? Um, what do you mean? Well, like, uh, you could just use VI and edit JavaScript. That'll work, but it doesn't give you very much power for introspection, really understanding what Node.js is and things like that. But you also have, like, commercial IDs like... Uh, well, Eclipse and WebStorm and stuff. I'm just wondering, do your, does your team have any sort of uh, consensus on what they're using? Uh, uh, no, no. Um, everyone is using what they are most familiar with or what they most like. Um, I think Oliver is using Atom, um, and I'm not so sure about the other ones. I think some guy is even using Vim from time to time, but I'm not so sure about <laughs> that. Um <laughs> We, we, we are all about being open, you know, and everyone can use the tools he wants to use, um, at least uh, if he is yeah, well, the most efficient with that tool. And we don't want to limit people um, by saying you have to use that one tool. Do you have a, do you have test, a test suite to be able to check that you're not breaking things? Yes. Um, all of us heavily adding new tests every week. 
Um, and we are taking this extremely serious in terms of testing, in terms of uh, finding bugs and glitches and so on. Um, we know that we are handling a lot of money here, money which doesn't only belong to us. And yes, we take a lot of efforts into that direction. That's why new updates are coming out so slowly, okay? Um, if you have some kind of a SaaS or a normal website, you can push out new updates every day. But at a cryptocurrency, this is another game. You have to test it extremely carefully. I would assume for every day of coding, you have another day or even longer for testing. Um, and I think this is the right mindset to have because we don't want to get hacked um, or we don't want to um, let users find any sort of glitches. Okay, um, I've, I've got a question for you. Um, I've seen it mentioned that there's not a white paper released on LISC and LSK yet. Uh, is that something that's in the works? Yes. Um, we are working on this white paper since the beginning, okay? And um, we really want to make it good so that developers have a great foundation um, to understand LISC. And I estimate from this point of time, we are done in like two or three weeks. Um, I think I will really put a focus on the white paper for the next days and weeks um, because this is really something I want to push out so that developers can take a look at LISC and see what's so special and great about it. So yes, it's in the works and it will be, develop uh, it will be published quite soon. Um, I guarantee that, yes. Okay, sounds good. Um, and I, I did have one more question. Um, Obviously, you've got it. You've gotten the company started through crowdfunding. Once, once you hit the end of that that uh, crowdfunding money, what what's kind of your commercialization plan? How do you plan to make to make money to be able to keep pushing Lisk forward in the future? Mm -hmm. So Lisk itself should always remain like a neutral, decentralized network which doesn't make any money um, directly. Um, because we think that a neutral or a network like LISC is one um, should stay as neutral as possible. Okay, I think this is extremely important because, like, if there are specific um, um, sources of income, we always would benefit them. Um, we don't want that. We want to stay very, um, yeah, like decentralized and neutral. Um, we are planning the whole roadmap to be finished like one or one and a half before our money is depleted um, so that we definitely have enough money to build LISC itself into a great tool, into a great platform. And once we are at the stage where um, we are a great platform, everyone, every single person on, in the world can implement new features simply on top, okay? Um, we only need to maintain the platform itself um, while new features can be implemented as blockchain apps or blockchain services. Um, in regards to that, we will probably implement some kind of a decentralized voting mechanism in the future to vote on new features which developers might want to take a look at. Um, but yes, we are planning to let this mo money, what we have, be enough um, for the next years. And I think it will be enough for probably six to seven years um, because we are spending it extremely carefully, okay? It's not like I, I just was in uh, China and it wasn't like I'm staying in a five-star hotel for 500 euros a night. I just took the cheapest one possible to find so that we have more money for development. And I think this is extremely important that we have the fundings um, to build what we want to build. Well, it still seems, uh, following up on that, it still seems that at some point you run out of the money you have. And then what? Will the team simply uh, go the four corners of the earth or... Or will we, you stay together, adopt a more traditional model of maybe consulting to help people get on uh, using LISC? Because I'm, mm -hmm. I, I can already see that it would be great, you know, if, if I'm a, you know, just beginning to want to use it, I should be able to, to talk to experts and uh, even for hire if it's, if it's part of my business model. So will yeah. you consider being, becoming a consultant team then? Um, okay, so... 
Lisk itself is running on delegate proof of stake, okay? And with every block generated, we are introducing a few new Lisk being cached out to the delegate who is or who was generating this block. And we assume that in maybe five to seven years or even later, um, the Lisk network as a whole will be a lot more worth than it is today. And then we can live from donations from these delegates because they mm. get a lot of money and I and our original purpose was to be like self-sufficient so that we don't need as much uh, money as we even collected. This was more like a surprise. Um, so yes, in the future, if we don't have any funds left from the ICO, we assume that a lot of delegates will funnel funds through us. And of course, there's always the option to develop a, a new blockchain application on top of Lisk and, new, and do a new crowdfunding for that. But this is really something for like in seven years. And we have seven years to think about a solution um, and um, what, about a solution we might want to take. Is there a position in this all this computation for me to rent a, a cloud server, a cheap cloud server, run the server-side stuff on it and announce that uh, you can use my machine as long as I'm on the, one of these delegated uh, uh, side chains? Yes, yeah, so not at this moment, but once we have implemented this delegate marketplace, I explained, um, I think everyone can simply plug into our network and offer his services to blockchain app developers and users. Um, I think this will be a huge market in the future so that everyone can simply buy a Raspberry Pi and um, install Lisk on it and then he can start securing many different types of applications and get small amounts of money for that. Um, I think this will be a big, um, like a big, maybe even a new job category in the future to be like a sidechain secure or something like that, who is simply taking care of sidechains and securing them and being paid for that. Wow, cool. So uh, when the world's economy collapses even further, maybe the London people can all start uh, doing that. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, I talked to a couple of London guys last night and they're going, uh, it's going to be tough. So that'll be cool. Um, so let me back up a step. I'm curious about this. I want to play with it. What skills do I need? I mean, probably the, the skill to code up a, a Node.js application, uh, obviously, and all the JavaScript behind that and everything like that. Uh, and I want to talk to an SDK somewhere. What? What are my steps? How, 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 if there are people, especially in our audience, that are interested in this and going further with it, how do I get from ha not touching it at all to actually having something that's doing something real? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, first of all, you would have to know JavaScript, HTML, CSS to build the back end and front end of your application, and then it's sure. simply a map. Yeah, and then it's simply a matter of going to our documentation on www.lisk.io and checking out our guides, our tutorials, our example blockchain applications and so on and just playing around with it on your own local testnet of Lisk. Um, as I mentioned, I'm not really a programmer, but I did this a few weeks ago as well and I developed a Gist book and a Twitter-like app as well. So it's really simple. Um, obviously it depends on what you want to implement, but you can start with really, really simple stuff like a messenger or like a gist book and so on. Um, can also take a look at, um, yeah, well, public repositories on GitHub, which are blockchain applications on Lisk and yeah, just fork them, play around again. And it's not really that hard. And I think after someone have read our documentation and knows JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, he will get the hang out of it pretty quickly. Mm. Oh, great, great. Okay, good that there's already that much. Well, I'm also amazed since this project is so young that you have so many people participating already. Is it is this because it's filling the wrong way to say it, it's filling a well needed gap? But I, what I mean is, um, you know, it, it was there already some sort of vacuum? 
that this is now filling? Well, it seems like that, right? Um, I'm, not so <laughs> sure, I'm not so sure why we get so much attention everywhere. Um, but yeah, it seems like we are really filling like a gap in the industry. Um, it seems like people want decentralized and blockchain-based applications. It seems people really want to deploy their own side chains, either for prototyping or to build really serious applications for it or on it. Um, and I think a lot of people also see the huge um, potential this has and are just investing in, into the network uh, because it's currently quite, yeah, I wouldn't call it cheap, but it's at a low market cap. And mm -hmm. they, they definitely can see that it goes to, I don't know, a billion dollars or so. So I think it's a mix of a lot of different factors like um, being uh, like speculating on the network's worth, um, seeing that this technology is awesome and that a lot of people really want to see it. Um, and maybe even some kind of interest simply like, okay, what, what can this 24 years old guy really achieve in the world? And let's just take, take a gamble, you know? <laughs> so yeah, nice. it's a factor of multiple things. And I'm really happy about all the, um, all the interest we got. Um, I just recently spoke to over 700 people in a huge hall in China, in Beijing, and it was really great. It's like an entirely different um, atmosphere than you experience in cryptocurrency forums. Everyone is positive. Everyone wants to know more about your project and is really interested into it. So that's like the hope I see for the cryptocurrency industry as a whole, um, that it doesn't, that it's not like in the forums, but the real world is really looking at each individual project and really tries to um, get into it and tries to, um, yeah, trying to, tries to make it better, okay? Cool, cool. Did I just overhear that you're 24? Yes, I am. Oh my God! <laughs> you, you crazy kids! You're just breaking the world, making it all new and different and that stuff. I'm an old geezer already. I'm I'm 54, so it's, it's coming up a long way, sir. Yeah, I, I'm, we're almost out of time. Uh, but is there anything we haven't covered that you want to make sure our audience is aware of? Um, I think we pretty much talked about everything. Um, I might want to talk about blockchain services. Um, it's a little bit different from blockchain applications. Um, a blockchain application might be something like a decentralized social network, okay? But a, blo uh, a blockchain service um, introduces some decentralized feature. Um, for example, it's an identity, okay? And this can be an identity on a side chain. That means on a global decentralized ledger. And this identity service can now be included into every centralized app as well. Um, if you have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on, you always have to make a new profile and include your same information again and again, okay? And with such a decentralized worldwide ledger of identities, you can simply um, make it with one click and all your information is already there, okay? And these are also like services which can be built on this with the help of um, side chains. And I really think this is the future and we at LISC want to make the world more decentralized, more connected, and simply a better stay in terms of apps. Does that mean that I could create one of these services, put it up on some servers, advertise that it's there somehow, and then every time people use it, I get paid a little bit of LISC? Yes, sure. Um, if you are the owner, of this blockchain service, um, you can say, okay, you can make an identity and I get paid one list for it. Or you can make some kind of a reputation marketplace where every identity now in another blockchain service um, can simply plug into or opt into your reputation um, service and yeah, accumulate reputation by other users on the network. And by doing so, so you get like LISC tokens as well. And this way you get fundings as well or profit. So yes, you can make a lot of money with blockchain services, um, especially if they get adopted worldwide. Wow. Wow. I think I may have my next job. 
Except I'll have to finish learning JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is really microcurrents or micropayments worked out, you know, because we have been having a lot of trouble figuring out how to put services like this up, and mm -hmm. and and do that. And this solves that problem. If the, if if nothing else comes out of this, that that is brilliant. It's absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yes. exciting. I'm glad you set yes. up. See, we didn't find that in the docs. So you got to make that more prominent in your docs. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, I just pitched this vision of blockchain apps and services in China, and we are currently like changing all the documentations um, and our website towards that um, because I think this is one of the biggest, um, well, disruptions the app market will see because this way apps can really work together and not stay in their own encapsulated environments, you know, um, creating like new decentralized global ledgers for everything, for identities, for for reputation, for trust and so on. Okay. And every, every app can simply implement it. So I, th I, I see a huge, like a huge, um, opportunity in this area for entrepreneurs and for existing app developers. I, I mean, uh, just really disruptive in my opinion. Absolutely. And is, is there already a good marketplace to go back and forth from LISC to uh, other cryptocurrencies and maybe yes. dollars? Yes, um, we, have, we are on Poloniex. This is the biggest cryptocurrency exchange in the world. Um, we are on Shapeshift. You can simply exchange Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Litecoin, and so on for Lisk there. Uh, we are also on many Chinese exchanges like Yuan Bao or Jubi, um, who are also one of the biggest altcoin exchanges in China. And well, actually, I will release a press release tomorrow, which states all the exchanges we are being listed on. It's by now, uh, by now over 10 exchanges. So it should be quite easy for Bitcoiners to get into LISC. Um, in the future, we definitely also want to make it more accessible for euro and dollar holders. Um, and we are working already with some um, companies who are doing that stuff. So yes, it's not so hard for people to get into LISC. Wow, wow. Okay, okay. Yeah, now this is on my list of things, as I say at the beginning of the show. <laughs> things I want to <laughs> download right after this show and then go check it out, except I never get enough time to check anything out anymore. So it's sort of a, a sort of a hand wave, actually, that, that happens <laughs> that way. Uh, hey, this has been fascinating. I think we could talk another hour then about all of the stuff that you're talking about there. Uh, we'll probably have you back on in about six months so we can see how it's going or maybe maybe more like a year, but we'll, we'll fit you in somewhere. But this is brilliant yeah. stuff. Um, maybe we'll have you on with your CTO so we can get some of the technical stuff expressed again too. So uh, yes, keep that definitely. in mind. Yes, awesome. definitely. I will keep it in mind. And uh, I will also work on our presentation to make it more accessible for users to learn really what LISC is about. Uh, so, yep. yes, we will move, move fast and rapid in the next months. Well, Max, it's been great having you on the show. And uh, good luck to you. I hope you become a multimillionaire out of this. <laughs> thanks, man. Thanks. And thanks for having Thank me. You. And um, I'm looking for, forward to see this interview at a later stage on great. the website. Right, right. It'll, it'll be out in about uh, six hours, four hours, somewhere in there. So we're pretty fast. Okay. okay. All right, thanks. That was uh, Max Kordak talking to us about this amazing, amazing new project. Uh, what did you think, Jonathan? Oh, it's, it's, it's hard to wrap the mind around in just 45 minutes. Um, it sounds like they've got a lot going on. The, yeah. the concept of blockchain and sidechain could be very powerful. I like the fact that each of the individual apps don't have the ability to poison the central blockchain, which is something that obviously Ethereum just ran into. Um, and then they've, they've added this concept of usefulness to it, which is something that, in my opinion, Bitcoin really lacks. Bitcoin is really a fiat. It's a cryptocurrency, but it's fiat. It doesn't have anything behind it of real value. But with Lisk, they've got an actual useful layer to it that could make them um, uh, much more, give it an intrinsic value. Um, I think it needs a killer app to really take off. They've got to get uh, something akin to a Facebook or a Twitter in their uh, ec ecosystem. 
And if they could do that, it would really explode. But it's very, it's very impressive for where they're at, being such a young project. Well, like you said, uh, talking about identity, uh, this the idea of a single sign-on, uh, and not just the way like they say log in with Facebook, okay, and that gives you an identity, but then you got to re-enter all your crap again. You know, well, that's not that's what are you getting from Facebook except you know a way to know that that's me, the same me that's on this other system. If you aren't also able to preload then everything that I've typed seventeen hundred times and all the other websites I sign up with, especially the ones where I s sign up with Facebook. It's like, it, it doesn't do me any good. And I know there's privacy issues there, but, you know, I'm willing to share the same set of public information everywhere I sign onto a new machine. And I, I don't get that yet. And maybe if somebody can do, uh, you know, uh, all the public things I want people to know about me uh, against an identity and then maybe do something like OAuth or some other way, because a lot of the sites use OAuth. Mm -hmm. Um and that would be really cool. Or maybe this could completely replace OAuth. I don't know. It's, uh, well, I know, I know one of the issues with, <laughs> I know one of the issues with what, Facebook what is, is that uh, you, you don't want to give one of these applications that uses OAuth the ability to then go and make changes to your profile or post on your wall. So there, there's right. all kinds of security and privacy questions that pop up when you do something like that. We could probably talk for another hour about that, but we are out of time. We're coming against the hard deadline on this, so let me just wrap up the show. Upcoming, up, upcoming next week. Coming next week. <laughs> upcoming, because there's upcoming guests. Uh, Aurelia, which is a JavaScript reactive framework from uh, uh, similar to Angular because it was formerly an Angular guy who was, uh, got a little tired of the uh, pace that the Angular 2 was doing, so he went off and did his own. It's much simpler to learn, simpler to use. I promise that, anyway, from the... I am promised that from the website, so that'll be cool. Uh, and only just the, 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 the guts, all, only the, the required guts. Uh, coming up after that, Koha ILS, which is a library information system to track your books and uh, take your requests and be able to share books among libraries, things like that. LucidWorks, which is searching your local data in a way that works really cool. Uh, Karina, which is an easy-to-use, instant-on, native container form environment from Rackspace. And they promise... No infrastructure. I'm sorry. There is no way you're doing anything in this world now with no infrastructure. Yeah, crazy. Uh, but they're coming on to explain themselves. Uh, someone from Capital One, they've got a number of um, open source uh, projects uh, in the works. They currently have one that's already available called Hygia. Hi 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 I don't know. I'll probably see them at uh, Red Hat uh, Summit in a few few hours here. Uh, it's a monitoring dashboard, so that's the first one. But they plan on many things coming out. Um, Cluster HQ projects, which is, if you're familiar with Flocker, Devol, Elliot, Machina, and PowerStrip, uh, it's that cluster of projects. We'll get somebody on from the team there to talk about that. Uh, Linux Presentation Day, which appears to me to be something where, from all over Europe, uh, they're having a single day, uh, Europe-wide, when many, many local uh, gatherings to uh, learn more about Linux, uh, learn to promote Linux, things like that. I don't. It's not very clear on the website exactly what that is. So, again, the elevator pitch. Always remember the elevator pitch, guys. You've got to be able to read something on the website and understand in 30 seconds what it's about. Because I'm telling you how hard it is for me to figure out what these projects are all about. Okay, uh, that's all we've got scheduled, but we've got talking with a lot of people right on the short list. If you want to see that short list, go to twitch.tv slash floss, and linked from there is the big spreadsheet. Uh, I, can, I always use more guests, though. If you want your favorite project right up front on, on this list, uh, you tell the project manager or a community leader, to email me, Merlin at StoneEngine.com. My address is, in fact, right there on that same page, twit.tv slash loss. Um, we have a live stream. We took a number of questions from it. Uh, it starts at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays at live.twit.tv. You can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google+, Plus, which is retweeted over to Floss Weekly, uh, all one word, on Twitter. Uh, you can follow me at Randall L. Schwartz on Google+. Plus. That, of course, is also uh, uh, retweeted back over to Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N. Uh, I am at Red Hat Summit this week. If you are also at Red Hat Summit, please come up and say hi. Uh, I'm just coming here as press. I'm not speaking on anything, but I'll be uh, hanging out probably mostly at the uh, pavilion because it appears to be where everybody will be hanging out um, that wants, would, would want to be interviewed on Floss Weekly. Uh, but that's uh, uh, Tuesday through Thursday as we're taping this. Um, and then uh, next week, I'm going back to Austin uh, uh, to the Texas Linux Fest, and that is going to be fun. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not going to Fizzle uh, in September, October, whatever it was. Uh, oh, no, it was actually last week. Next week. It's next week. Okay, because I'm, uh, I'm still a little weird about the Zika virus. I don't want to be a, a vector for that. And I am going to be at Dragon Con this year. That's uh, Hotlanta in uh, Labor Day weekend. Uh, that's going to be really, really cool. And then, so here I am at uh, getting ready for the Red Hat Summit uh, today. And I went out with some of my Pearl monger friends from San Francisco. I hadn't seen them in a while. And I look over, I'm in this pub. I look over and I see Jono Bacon. Yes, our friend John o. Bacon, And when I think of all the places he could have been, he was there at that same uh, dive bar last night. And so he called me over and we chatted for a while. And he said, you know, Randall, I have a new job that's a lot more flexible. And I really, really miss Floss Weekly. And he says, can I be a co-host again from time to time? And I said, hell yeah. So uh, we're going to be bringing back the bacon soon. So uh, that's going to be a pleasant return to uh, for for the for the thing because yeah, like I said, he's not working for uh, who runs Ubuntu. It's uh, uh, the company, uh, whatever it is. Okay, I don't remember. It's the company for Ubuntu. Do you know it, Jonathan? I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing Jonathan. So canonical? maybe it's all canonical. Yeah, canonical. Yeah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> you were probably muted, right? <laughs> no problem. No problem. Oh, well. <laughs> Again, just taking up more time here. Okay, so he's no longer working for canonical. He's got his own business going on. And so he says, I will, I will return. So great. So I'll have to follow up with him in a day or two to make sure that happens. Anyway, uh, anything you want to plug uh, there, Jonathan? Uh, we should have a project uh, coming out uh, a little bit more mainstream in a couple of months, but it's it's not ready yet. So um, I will, uh, I'll just stay in stealth mode for now. Okay. All right. Well, let me know. Let me know when you got it. Um, all right. Well, it's the end of another show again. Sorry for the occasional video glitches and stuff. I'm in a hotel Wi-Fi, which is always bad words to mix together. So, but, uh, thanks Jonathan for uh, being the co-host this time again. Uh, you have now, you're now, you don't have two gold stars by your name. So you just have just one and you got two. All right. So we're definitely bringing you back at some time in the future. Not immediately, probably. We'll let some other people step in on the next three in a row shows. might be a little Our, much. Uh, yes. Insane. Insanely. So, uh, try about 20 in a row. <laughs> It's 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 a it's a it's a labor of love and uh, a, a way of getting attention from people. So that works both ways. All right. So we'll see you again next week on Floss Weekly. Floss Weekly.